Thank you. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be back to Northwestern um, and to see familiar faces, friends from law school. Andy Koppelman and I were subjected to the Yale Law School together, um, and, uh, and I'm happy to be back here. I want to talk to you today <clears throat> about an issue which is uh, increasingly at the center of at least uh, people who are awake when they think about our federal government. Um, and we could describe that in a lot of ways. I want to frame it as a problem of the ungovernability that has developed within our nation. Now, I don't mean ungovernable about one particular issue. I, I want to suggest, with respect to any issue, across a, across a wide range of contexts, sensible policy uh, is increasingly impossible to imagine our Congress adopting. Um, whether it's Wall Street regulation or climate change or the debt or taxes or health care, um, the country's become ungovernable in a way that I think we cannot ignore, and so we must begin by understanding if we're going to have a sense of how to fix it. Now, to get a sense of what the source of this ungovernability is, I want to point to a familiar collection of essays, um, <clears throat> the Federalist Papers, which were, of course, a brief, the successful brief, that made the case for the adoption of our Constitution. And as is our tradition, we focused our admiration in a couple places, but maybe none more firmly than on Federalist Number 10, um, as summarized in the uh, study in the context of the Harvard Law Review, it's difficult to overstate the importance of the theory to today's understanding of the Constitution and American government. They're referring to the theory of our Constitution offered in Federalist 10. And at the core of that theory is an understanding of the problem of faction. And as uh, Madison describes this problem of faction, um, the faction, he says, I understand a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or a minority of the whole, who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. Uh, and he identifies two possible ways to deal with the problem of faction. One, he says, we can deal with by removing its causes. Excuse me, we are make sure that we get to hear this. And, and when you think about the idea of removing the causes of faction, it's not a, a program that many people embrace, because to remove the causes of faction is to remove differences among people. But I was, in, I was intrigued to discover a project eager to remove the causes of faction. Here's a little brief uh, introduction to it. The first is an initiative called Mosaic Earth. The mission is very simple. We eliminate debate, and I mean this literally, in any area with any amount of emotionally charged, multi-layered problem that you could imagine. It's a little terrifying, the idea of literally eliminating <laughs> debate, but that's that project. Uh, that wasn't Madison's project. His objective was not to find a way to make us all the same or to eliminate debate. So instead of focusing on the causes, Madison wanted to think about the effects. Um, and so he had to think about the effects in two different contexts, because as is described, he identifies both a majority and a minority faction. So first, with respect to the minority faction, he says, relief is supplied by the Republican principle, which enables the majority to defeat its sinister views by regular vote. It may clog the administration, it may convulse the society, but it will be unable to execute and mask its violence under the forms of the Constitution. And that's very different from the problem presented by the majority faction. When a majority faction is included in a faction, the form of popular government, on the other hand, enables it to sacrifice to its ruling passion or interest, both the public good and the right of other citizens, to secure the public good and private rights against the danger of such a faction, and at the same time to preserve the spirit and the form of popular government is then the great object, object to which our inquiries are directed. And then in the remaining parts of 10 and, and other places throughout the Federalists, we have what I think of as a bunch of hand-waving to suggest that there is something in the structure of our Constitution that guarantees we can deal with this problem of this uh, um, 
majority faction. Uh, and so, as is familiar to many, the structure of our republic, a large republic, provides the infrastructure to guarantee against this idea of a majority faction. So turning against the tradition, it turns out our vices, namely a large republic, um, are our virtues, namely the means by which a majority faction can be tamed. Now, it's our tradition to celebrate the brilliance in this solution. Uh, many places in the court's uh, jurisprudence where they point to the genius of the framer's pragmatic vision. The only problem is that it was totally wrong. Um, totally wrong to deal with these problems of faction. So in the context of the uh, majority faction, it wasn't this magical structure of a large extended republic. It turned out to be the Bill of Rights in the way that this got uh, interpreted uh, through the history of our republic. And with respect to the minority faction, the core reality of the modern republic is this is just not solved. We have nothing like a mechanism inside of our system to solve the minority faction problem. The special interest problem is at the core of what I described the ungovernability to be. This part of the project was a total bust. We could give it an F if we were to grade them. The, so the trouble, the puzzle is this or text in our constitutional tradition um, seems not to provide the means by which to understand how this core problem of our current constitution might be addressed. But I want to suggest that if we go back to the Madisonian framing and think less about the part of the story that involved the hand waving and a little bit more about this small phrase by the Republican principle, we can both identify the source of the problem that I think we have today and something of its solution. So that's the introduction. Here's the argument I want to make. Okay, as is familiar to lawyers, this concept of corruption has magical powers vis-a-vis -vis the First Amendment. Because the First Amendment, which otherwise prohibits laws which abridge the freedom of speech, is conditioned, according to our tradition, because if the speech constitutes corruption, then the court said you're allowed to abridge away. So this means the definition of corruption is quite significant. Because if something's corruption, Congress has the power to restrict speech. If it's not, Congress doesn't have that power. So what is this conception of corruption? Well, if we think of corruption a little bit metaphorically, this little roach in the middle of our uh, influence project, this negative influence we can imagine applying to Congress. And then analytically, we can think of it as also applying to the people. So in the context of what we traditionally think of as quid pro quo corruption, it's not really directly against Congress. Quid pro quo corruption operates against particular individuals. And in the understanding of quid pro quo corruption developed in the jurisprudence, we understand this to be an influence within this economy of influence that's corruption because it steers members of Congress away from a focus that they are intended to have upon the people. So it is corrupting at the level of the individual because it undermines a Republican character of the Republic, namely a representative character of the Republic. Because of course, the framers didn't give us a democracy, they gave us what they called a Republic, though the Federalists make clear by that they mean a representative democracy, and quid pro quo corrupts that representation because the representative is not focused on the we in we the people. And since Buckley, in 1976, the court has been clear that regulation, speech regulations of corruption are just fine, but its focus in that case was the corruption of quid pro quo corruption. Okay. But what about the analytic flip? What about influences directed against the people? Can those two be thought of as a kind of corruption? Well, the state of Michigan thought it could be conceived of as a kind of corruption. They focused on the corporation and the power of the corporation in the context of political speech. 
And as the court, for a brief time, upheld this regulation, the court referred to this influence as a, quote, different type of corruption. They spoke of the corrosive and distorting effects of immense aggregations of wealth and the accumulated within, with the help of corporate form with little or no correlation to the public support for the corporation's political ideals. That influence, that force, corrupts or distorts the political process, Michigan thought, and the Supreme Court agreed for a while. But that distortion is not a distortion of the representative. The distortion was a distortion of the people. It was its effect on the people that was the source of the motivation for the restriction on corporate speech. Um, and so if that was corruption, it was only corruption because of its corrupting of us, the people. And it was because of inequality in speech that it corrupted us. And the remedy Michigan thought was to find a way to equalize that speech so that we, the people, were not distorted. Okay. Just about four years ago in Citizens United, the Supreme Court made clear that its little detour notwithstanding, that was not, quote, corruption. Uh, because one way to understand this is we, the people, can't be corrupted, or at least the distortion of we, the people, can't be seen by the court, or at least, let's say, the state can't remedy it. We, the people, are on our own uh, to take care of ourselves. The First Amendment's interpreted to say there will be no guardian of equality to protect us from the distorting effect of other speech. We have to deal with that distortion ourselves. Uh, and the Supreme Court's, the, the consequence of the Supreme Court's opinion is where the objective is to make sure the influence on the people is not distorting, that objective is constitutionally not permitted because it's not corruption. Now, I think this aspect of Citizens United is rightly decided. I don't think inequality in speech is corruption. I don't think the distortion of speech should be treated as corruption. I don't think it should be within the scope of Congress or any legislature's power to address. Um, and it would be if we had a different tradition, you know, if we had, for example, Demosthenes as our uh, model where inequality is addressed by a dummy or putting pebbles. Demosthenes had to speak with pebbles because he spoke so well to achieve equality in the speech market. But in this respect, the United States is not Greece, or at least not Greece yet. Um, instead, we embrace a conception that says the effect of the speech is unregulable where we're talking about its effect on the people. Okay. So the model the court gives us then is if we're worrying about the effect of a corrupting influence on Congress, it's plausible that it is corruption and therefore regulable. But if we're worrying about the effect of speech on the people, it's not plausible that it's corruption and therefore is not regulable. So that begs an important question. Is the quid pro quo corruption the only kind of corruption that might be regulable? Is quid pro quo the only, quote, corruption within the field that Congress might address. OK, now, it's not, it's not news here. Um, there's an important school of constitutional interpretation. Um, we could refer to it as originalism. The objective of originalism is to understand how a particular question uh, would have been understood by the framers, how the framers would have understood the question is at least the first step in understanding how the question would be applied today. So it's not necessarily the end, it's just the beginning. And my work since the beginning of my constitutional scholarship has been work within this tradition of originalism. Um, I was taught at the uh, feet of an important originalist. Um, so I want to take that first question seriously as applied to this term corruption. How would the framers have understood the concept of corruption? Meaning, how would the framers have understood this, as we've seen it, exception to the scope of the First Amendment? Would they have understood corruption to mean quid pro quo corruption alone? 
would they have understood it as applying to individuals or would they have thought of as it applying to institutions? And if it under applies to institutions, if it predicates of institutions as well as individuals, then what would it mean? Well, I've been arguing about this for a while and finally wanted to address it in some systematic way. So we hired some researchers who went to um, this source for uh, online um, collections of framing documents. And I asked the researchers to collect every instance of the use of the term corruption within the framing period. You know, so the traditional sources of Federalist Papers, but as broadly as they could. And we identified from this source 325 um, appropriate uses in the sense of we're really talking about corruption as it applies in the context of um, government uh, that we could code. And we coded these to distinguish between individual corruption and institutional corruption and in the context of both quid pro quo corruption and in the context of institutional corruption, what, what kind of uh, dynamic was being described. Of the 325 instances that we identified, 57% were cases where corruption was predicating of an institution, not an individual. So speaking of the corruption of parliament, not the corruption of a member of parliament. Quid pro quo was certainly present in the range of uses. Of the 300 uh, some uses, it appeared six times in the context of the population that we were looking at. And in every one of these six instances, by quid pro quo, they were talking about corruption of an individual. So in the balance of the cases, the almost 60% where they're talking about institutions, what was the kind of corruption that they were talking about? And they were talking, describing what we could think of as a kind of improper dependence that had developed for the institution. So for example, parliament improperly depended upon the king. That's a corruption of parliament. And this usage, this frame for understanding what corruption is was five times more frequent than the reference to quid pro quo corruption. So improper dependence then is a normal way for the framers to be speaking when they speak about corruption. So what would improper dependence in our context look like? Okay. Well, I want to introduce it with a story I've tried to spread this story broadly, so let me spread it a little bit more here in Chicago. All stories begin something like this. Once upon a time, um, there was a place called Lesterland. All right, so it wasn't in the introduction. It was a comprehensive introduction, but I'm glad you didn't mention this. My first name is actually Lester, um, so I'm allowed to make fun of Lester, so I'm going to make fun of Lester's here a little bit. So here it is, the story of Lesterland. Now, Lesterland looks a lot like the United States. Like the United States, there are about 311 million people in Lesterland. And like the United States, it turns out there are about 144,000 people whose name is Lester. The internet told me that, so it must be true. So let's assume it's 144,000 in the United States and in Lesterland, which means about 0.05% of the population of Lesterland is named Lester. Now, Lesters in Lesterland have an interesting power. There are two elections every election cycle in Leicesterland. One of them is the general election. The other is called the Leicester election. In the general election, it's the citizens who get to vote. So if you're over 18, in some states if you have an ID. In the Leicester election, it's the Leicesters who get to vote. And here's the catch. To be allowed to run in the general election, you must do extremely well in the Leicester election. You don't necessarily have to win, but you must do extremely well. Okay, that's democracy in Leicesterland. What can we say about that democracy? Well, we can say, number one, as the Supreme Court said in Citizens United, the people in Leicesterland have the ultimate influence over the elected officials, because after all, there is a general election. But it's not hard to see the sense in which that ultimate influence is shrunk because the people have that influence only after the Lesters have had their way with the candidates 
who wish to run in that general election. And number two, obviously, this dependence upon Lester's is likely to produce subtle, understated, camouflaged bending to keep the Lester's happy. Okay, so it's a democracy, one that's dependent upon the Lester's and dependent upon the people. These are competing dependencies, and they could be conflicting dependencies depending upon who the Lester's are. Okay, that's the conception of Lesterland. Now, there are three things I want you to see now that I've introduced this allegory of Lesterland. Number one, the United States is Lesterland. The United States is Lesterland. The United States also looks like this, also has two elections. Uh, one election is the voting election. The other election we should call the money election. In the voting election, all citizens get to vote if you're over 18. Some states that you have an ID. In the money election, it's the funders of campaigns who get to vote. And here's the catch, as in Lesterland, to be allowed to run in the voting election, you must do extremely well in the money election. You don't necessarily have to win, but you must do extremely well. And here's the key to the link between Lesterland and the United States. There are just as few relevant funders in USA land as there are Lesters in Lesterland and in USA land. Now you say, really? 0.05%? Here are the numbers of, from 2010. 2010, 0.26% of America, I know I'm a lawyer, so I don't do numbers well, but I really mean one quarter of 1% of America gave $200 or more to any congressional candidate. 0.05% gave the maximum amount to any congressional candidate. 0.01%, the 1% of the 1%, gave $10,000 or more. And from 2012, my favorite statistic is 0.000042%. For those of you doing the numbers, you know that's 132 Americans gave 60% of the super PAC money spent in that election cycle. All right, so between 0 0.26, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01, at the most, 0.05% of America are the relevant funders of congressional campaigns. In this sense, these funders are our Lesters. Now, what can we say then about democracy in USA land? Well, number one, as in Citizens United, we can say the court was right to say the people have the ultimate influence over elected officials because, of course, there is a voting election, but only after the funders have had their way with the candidates who wish to run in that general election. And number two, obviously, this dependence upon the funders is going to produce a subtle, understated, camouflaged bending to keep the funders happy. Members of Congress and candidates for Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money to get back to Congress. And the question we need to think about is, what does it do to them as they spend their time dialing for dollars from the tiniest fraction of the 1% of America? As they do this, they develop, remember this image of the Skinner box, they become the modern version of the Skinner box as they learn which buttons they need to push in order to get the sustenance that they need and it doesn't take a PhD in psychology to recognize that this life produces in them a kind of sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what they do will affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shapeshifters, as they constantly adjust their views in light of what they know will help them to raise money, not on issues 1 to 10, but on issues 11 to 1,000. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. And to clarify, she went on, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> right? So here, too, we have a democracy, one dependent upon the funders and dependent upon the people. These are competing dependencies, maybe conflicting dependencies, depending upon who the funders are. Okay, that's the first claim. The United States is less than that. Here's the second. The United States is worse than Lesterland. Worse than Lesterland. Because in Lesterland, you can imagine if we Lesters got a letter from the government telling us that we got to pick the candidates who will run in the general election. You know, there are Lesters from every economic class. There are black Lesters, there are white Lesters, not many women Lesters, but put that to the side for a second. 
There's a wide range of Lesters. It's at least possible they would develop a kind of aristocracy of the Lesters. It's at least possible that the Lesters would be acting for the good of the Lesters because there's no obvious other thing for us to be doing unless it was direct rent seeking for the benefit of Lesters. So let's say that's at least possible. But that possibility notwithstanding, what we know about our land, this land, the USA land, is though there are some sweet Lesters out there, the vast majority of the Lesters in this picture are acting for the Lesters because the shifting coalitions that comprise this 0.05% are being constituted not in the name of the public interest, but instead in the name of the private interest that defines the issue that is just over the horizon that they are mobilizing in order to affect. So in this sense, the USA is worse than Lesterland. But it's the third point that I want to focus on most heavily. Because whatever one says about Lesterland, in our land, against the background of our traditions, we should recognize Lesterland is a kind of corruption. Now, I don't mean brown paper bag sense of corruption, cash secreted to members of Congress. I don't mean a kind of Rob Lagoyevich <laughs> sense of corruption. I'm not talking about any illegal act. Everything I'm talking about is perfectly legal, indeed in some conceptions, constitutionally protected. But it is still corruption relative to the framers' baseline. Because if the framers gave us a republic by which they meant a representative democracy, then as Federalist 52 describes, what they intended was a branch that would, of uh, the government that would be, quote, dependent upon the people alone. So here's their model of government. They would have the people, and they would have the government. I do my own slides. It's cool the way that bounces like that, right? So the people and the government. Creating this dependency, how would this exclusive dependency be produced? Well, it would be produced through these discrete elections every two years. As Madison wrote, frequent elections are unquestionably the only policy by which this dependence and sympathy can be effectually secured. So the people and the government produces this dependency, which is the core of how this part of our representative democracy shall function. The problem is our Congress has evolved a different dependence. Not a dependence upon the people alone, but a dependence as well upon the funders. This is a dependence too. But it is different and conflicting from a dependence upon the people alone, so long as the funders are not the people. This is a corruption. And we could call it a dependence corruption. It is a corruption of the intended dependence of the, um, at least, the popular branch of government. OK, now, there's good news and bad news about this corruption. The good news is it's bipartisan, equal opportunity corruption. It blocks the left on a wide range of issues the left cares about, from climate change to sensible health care, food safety, financial reform. It blocks the right, too. So for example, people on the right are eager to push for a smaller government. Um, Al Gore, when he was vice president, had an idea to deregulate a significant part of the telecommunications industry. His chief lobbyist on the policy took the idea to Capitol Hill. The response he got from Capitol Hill, as he reported it back to me, was, quote, hell no. If we deregulate these guys, how are we going to raise money from them? So the point is, the structure of regulation makes it easier to raise money. And so if you have as your objective the idea of shrinking the footprint of regulation, working against you is the fact that that makes it harder for these people to raise money. So the point is, this is a system designed to save the status quo against the reforms of both the left and the right. And so this bipartisanship you might think is good news, but the ultimate bad news is that this is a pathological democracy destroying corruption. Because in any system where such a tiny, tiny fraction has the capacity to influence, that means that the tiniest number, a really, really tiny number of this tiny fraction has the ability to block reform. And that ability has been perfected because of certain economy that has developed within DC, an economy of lobbyists and members and lesters, or let's just say more uh, neutrally, the interests that would leverage their influence inside the system to benefit themselves. And what's important to recognize about this economy 
is that it feeds on polarization. It feeds on dysfunction. The more dysfunctional, the more polarizing, the more profitable that economy is for the interests who function within it. This is the economy of no. Perversely, the worse that it is for us, citizens of the nation, the better it is for the prospect of fundraising within this system. This is the corruption. Okay, but is this a corruption that the Supreme Court could see? Would the Supreme Court recognize this? Could the Supreme Court recognize this as corruption against the background of the jurisprudence they've developed so far? Well, notice this is not an instance of influence trying to distort the people. This improper dependence is not a dependence that is a dependence that the people feel. This is a dependence that is affecting the government. So it fits within the structure of the kind of corruption the court has permitted Congress to regulate. It's not a corruption of the people. It's a corruption of representation, like quid pro quo corruption. The focus is not about how to change the people. The focus is not upon the people alone. The focus is upon the funders. And in my view, it should be a kind of corruption that Congress can regulate because its target is the way in which influences might be affecting the representative process. Now, how could this matter to the jurisprudence of the court if, in fact, the court were to recognize this kind of dependence corruption as the sort of corruption a legislature can address? Well, the first thing to recognize is it would not affect Citizens United. Because the regulation of Citizens United was a regulation targeted uh, of speech uh, for the people. The issue in Citizens United was Citizens United spending its corporate funds to promote a film, the objective of which was to change how people viewed Hillary Clinton. In my view, that speech should be constitutionally protected. There should be no doubt that the First Amendment prohibits any effort by Citizens United or any corporation or any individual to spend its money to change the views of the people. So its target was the people, and I think that's what defines it as constitutionally protected. Um, next, uh, in two weeks, the Supreme Court will hear arguments, in this case, McCutcheon versus the FEC, which raises the question of whether the aggregate contribution limits are constitutional. And this has been a question pressed because if the um, individual contribution limits, so $2,500 each election cycle, are constitutionally per permitted, if the individual limits don't constitute quid pro quo corruption, then why would aggregating the individual contributions constitute quid pro quo corruption? And in my view, that's a very fair question. If the only framework is quid pro quo corruption, I don't see how the aggregation could affect quid pro quo corruption. But from the perspective of dependence corruption, there's no reason why the limit, the aggregate limit, couldn't be upheld. Because what the aggregate limit addresses is not the quid pro quo. The aggregate limit is addressing precisely the issue I've described as dependence corruption. You're trying to avoid a world where Congress looks to 1,000 families to fund the campaigns and instead tries to force Congress to raise its money from a wider range of Americans, therefore minimizing the sense of dependence corruption. The most important shift, though, recognizing dependence corruption would produce is a shift that came out of the case uh, Speech Now um, versus the FEC. Speech Now is the case that gave us the super PAC, a case decided by the DC Circuit. The Supreme Court did not review this case. Now, it's not the super PAC's desire to speak to the people that could be affected by recognizing dependence corruption. Because again, I view, I think that the Supreme Court's jurisprudence says that when you're talking about the effect of speech on the people, it's constitutionally unregulable. But there is a dynamic of a super PAC that affects Congress directly. And we can think about this as the super PAC dynamic. That's Tony Soprano, if um, people don't quite recognize it. The suggestion here should be obvious. And it was explained to me in the context of a, a television show I was participating in um, with uh, Senator Bayh, 
Senator Bai was asked by someone um, what the effect of super PACs was on Congress, because the claim of the questioner was that there was no evidence, empirical evidence, that these were changing legislative results at all, so why should we be worried about super PACs? And he kind of rolled his eyes, and he said, you have no idea about how this has changed the way Washington works. He said, it used to be the case that if you were an incumbent, you had nothing to worry about, as long as you didn't sleep with your interns. Um, you were guaranteed um, re-election, so long as that's what you were interested in. But now every single incumbent is worried that 30 days before an election, some super PAC is going to come in and drop a million dollars on the other side. So understanding that as the threat, what do you do as an incumbent? And what he said, translated just a bit, is you have to buy super PAC insurance. So what's super PAC insurance? It's the guarantee that if somebody comes in and drops a bomb on one side, your super PAC is going to come in and buy enough to drop a bomb on the other side, to balance it out. So how do you buy super PAC insurance? Well, like with any insurance policy, you have to pay your premium in advance. Pay your premium in advance. And how do you pay your premium in advance? You behave in a way that the super PAC on your side wants you to behave so that when it comes time for them to defend you, they have a reason to defend you. So, Senator, we'd like to help you, but we can only support people who support us at 80% of our scorecard. You know what you need to do in order to assure yourself of the defense you need if, in fact, you need a defense. So the point is, without spending one dollar, this dynamic creates the incentives for members to begin to focus their attention in the direction of these super PACs, it is the economy of a protection racket, as people are investing to protect themselves against this ultimate threat. And so the idea is, this is the way the super PACs are directly affecting the representation process, and the constitutional question that would be raised is not the spending of the super PACs on the public, but the ways in which this funding of the super PACs might be affecting uh, representation. So in my view, this is the kind of corruption our framers could see. They could see this because we're talking about influences that are undermining the representative function in the way in which representatives go about doing the job of at least being dependent upon the people alone. Okay, now, this should be obvious, but this corruption has had an effect. And the particular effect I want to focus on is the way in which it helps to render us ungovernable. And it renders us ungovernable because of the economy it develops. This economy contributes to this ungovernability, and it contributes in two ways. The first I've already alluded to, this is the economy of no. And the second I want to talk about as the economy of extortion. So the economy of no is the more obvious one. You have a tiny fraction who have the capacity to block any change. And almost always, we can say, they have the capacity to stop any reform, which produces a certain kind of instability. And this instability, then, is the sense in which this polar, the economy depends upon this polarization and dysfunction. Dysfunction becomes the business model, because dysfunction makes it easier for those who need to trade to facilitate a trade that is valuable to at least some within the economy. This is peace in the nation which described um, uh, this dynamic and then actually pointed to a website of a lobbying firm which was bragging about their ability to use the particular tools inside of the Senate to facilitate the blocking of any change that you might want to block. Of course, once this article went down, up the uh, web page came down. But the point is the obvious economy here now is we now leverage these holds or these filibusters in a way that makes it so you can achieve the rent seeking you're seeking, which is now the rent seeking of blocking reform that might undermine your monopoly rent. So with this economy, you can think of a wide range of cases, whether it's healthcare reform on the left or government bailouts on the right or global warming for the left or complex taxes for the right or financial reform for the left or financial reform for the right, where no change is going to happen until we address or change this type of corruption because of the tiny number of what I'm calling Lester's that are necessary to block reform. This is the instability inside the system. And then second, there's a kind of extortion. Because I focused on the 0.05%, but we could also think about the 0.00014%, namely 
members of Congress. They are dependent inside the system. They are dependent upon funders. But that dependence creates its own dependencies. So here's an example. The Wall Street Journal um, in, the, in, the, in December of 2010 was puzzled over what they observed as the explosion of the temporary tax code. So by the temporary tax code, they're referring to the, the number of provisions in the tax code which are set to expire automatically. Um, and the number of these, they observe, has increased pretty dramatically. And the journal was puzzled about what might explain this uh, increase, because at, at, at a consequence of this increase is that each time one of these provisions is about to expire, there's a question about whether it will be extended. And that produces what the journal called this extender mania. But it should be obvious from the perspective of what I've described why we have this explosion of temporary provisions and this explosion of extenders. The first of these temporary provisions was given to us by Reagan, the 1981 Research and Development Tax Credit. That was made temporary so long, so as to test whether it would work. The Republicans said it would create the right kind of incentives. The Democrats said it wouldn't. So they said, let's make it temporary, and then we'll ask a bunch of economists after a period of time whether it worked. And so they did. Uh, and the answer was, it did work. Indeed, it made sense. It was unanimously supported in the studies that Congress was talking about on both the left and the right, because it was producing a kind of uh, investment that otherwise the economists thought would not be produced. But the puzzle is that that provision is temporary to this day. It still is a temporary provision inside of our tax code. So why is it? Well, as Rebecca Kaiser describes in this piece on the Georgia Law Review, the principal recipients of the research credit are large US manufacturing corporations. These business entities are more than willing to invest in lobbying activities and campaign donations to ensure the continuance of this large tax savings. And as the um, libertarian or right-wing Institute for Policy Innovation puts it, this cycle has repeated for years. Congress allows the credit to lapse until another short extension is given, preceded, of course, by a series of fundraisers and speeches about the importance of nurturing innovation. Congress essentially uses this cycle to raise money for re-election, promising industry more predictability the next time around. So we architect the tax policy, in part at least, to make it easier not to raise money for the federal treasury, but to make it easier to raise money for the, ca the ca campaign treasuries of the members of at least the tax committees. Or here's another example. Think about the context of Medicare. What I like about Medicare is this is a huge program, but there is no official logo of Medicare. I mean, it's <laughs> kind of an interesting cost savings, but you know, there's nothing this big in our economy that doesn't have an official logo, but here it is. Medicare doesn't. Um, Medicare has a pro project to, to produce the sustainable growth rate for Medicare. And the way this, um, this proposal is to work is that um, the reimbursement rates are supposed to be reduced every uh, uh, couple of years to make it so doctors are getting less and less to create the incentive for more and more efficiency. But of course, every time they're about to be reduced, there's something called the doc fix in Congress. The doc fix is basically an agreement that Congress has to put off the reduction of the rates the doctors get paid. But of course, that only happens after there's been a sustained interaction with the doctors to convince the doctors they need to help their allies within Congress to get the support necessary to put off this reduction in the rates the doctors will get for their reimbursement. So once again, this structure facilitates the fundraising necessary for the candidates to raise their money. Or one final example, remember the fiscal cliff, um, this fantastic piece that was in the Huffington Post, six things you wouldn't believe that are in the fiscal bill that the Senate moved and passed at 2 a.m. while most Americans were drunk. Remember, that was on New Year's Eve. Of course, it included a bunch of tax extenders, as the Wall Street Journal would have predicted. It included the doc fix to make sure that the reimbursement rates for doctors would not um, be uh, removed. But it also included this extraordinary thing, a provision to Amgen that produced a 9,900% return um, to Amgen on their political contributions because what this did was basically mean that a price for a certain patented drug would not be reduced as the law pr promised it would be reduced. Um, instead, it would maintain its current price and that would cost taxpayers $500 million in higher drug costs because of this thing dropped into the fiscal 
cliff savings bill. Now, I think this is something we should properly call extortion within the system. Members of government using their influence to leverage from the private sector the money the members of the government need to fund their campaigns. Fundraising enabling extortion. And once again, then the fundraising or the funding of the system is the key. I want to suggest it's the root to the problem on both the extortion and the instability side. And that suggests my hero Thoreau's framing of our understanding of social problems generally. As he says, there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. I think we need more root strikers in this discussion, recognizing how this fundraising architecture is at the core of the problem that we face. Okay, so what can we do about it? Well, the analytics here are easy. If the problem is not the problem of money in politics, or even the problem of the amount of money in politics, if the problem is a certain disciplining practice that members of Congress go through, produced by tons of time spent fundraising from the tiniest slice of America, then the solution to that problem is to find a way to have less time spent fundraising, and whatever time is spent fundraising, let's make sure it's from a wider slice of America. To spread out the funder influence to the extreme point, ideally, of a dependence upon the funders being the people, the people alone. And lots of proposals of ways to do this. Bruce Ackerman and Ian Ayers in their voting for dollars with dollars proposal imagines vouchers that candidates would, uh, that all voters would get that they could use to fund campaigns. I did a little bit of a modification of this in, a, in, in my book, Republic Lost, where I said that candidates could receive these vouchers conditional upon them agreeing to fund their campaigns with vouchers only, plus a small contribution of, let's say, up to $100 a candidate, so a $50 voucher, and then $100 um, um, from any citizen. Um, that's the Grant and Franklin project. But $50 vouchers to every voter would produce $7 billion in the system, which is three times the amount raised and spent in 2010. Um, the Americans Anti-Corruption Act, which is um, now a grassroots proposal that has received uh, hundreds of thousands of endorsements from citizens would create basically a $100 voucher and has a huge uh, chunk of regulation designed by Jack Abramoff to make it impossible for lobbyists to leverage their power inside the system. Or the Democratic caucus has now endorsed a set of proposals by John Sarbanes, this is the son of Paul Sarbanes, who's now a fourth term Democrat from Maryland, called the Grassroots Democracy Act which has a matching fund proposal, it has a tax credit proposal, and it has a pilot for what um, he calls coupon, but it's essentially a voucher proposal. Now the point is, all of these alternatives have as their objective bringing more citizens, ideally all citizens, into the position of being funders of campaigns, not just the Lesters. And in that sense, it addresses the analytical source of the problem and it's easy to see the way in which it might diffuse the analytical source of this problem. So the analytics are easy, it's the politics that's hard. And maybe impossibly hard, because the reform described here would effectively shrink the power of K Street, K Street where the lobbyists work, wouldn't make lobbying unnecessary, lobbying continues to be important and essential inside the democracy, but it radically shrinks the power of the lobbyists and lobbyists are increasingly important in explaining the capacity of Congress to do anything. Jim Cooper, who's a Democrat from Virginia, has been in Congress off and on since uh, the early 1980s. Says you have to, he explained to me, he says, you have to understand, Capitol Hill has become a kind of farm league for K Street. A farm league for K Street. What he means by that is members and staffers and bureaucrats have an increasingly common business model. A business model focused on their life after government, their life as lobbyists. Right, so public citizen calculated between 1998 and 2004, 50% of the Senate left to become lobbyists, 42% of the House. Those numbers have only gone up. And as United Republic calculated in April last year for the members, they tracked the average salary increase for the members that they had tracked that would like to become lobbyists was 1,452%. So in a system where everybody inside the Beltway depends upon this system surviving, it's fair to ask, how is it possible to imagine them changing this system? And the answer is, in all honesty, I'm not sure it is possible. 
I'm not sure it's actually feasible that our political system has the capacity to address this corruption. But a first step, I think, is to at least see how the corruption that I'm describing here is at least a corruption that the court must allow uh, to be remedied. Or even if it's not going to allow it, even if it's not going to allow the egalitarian conception of corruption, which I also don't endorse as a conception of corruption, they should at least address or permit remedies to what I've called dependence corruption, or to make it sharper for the originalist. It should be easy for the originalist to permit what I've called dependence corruption as a justification for Congress's regulation, because to make it as sharply as I can for the originalist, only a non-originalist would have the intellectual structure to limit corruption to quid pro quo corruption alone. Because an originalist should understand that in addition to quid pro quo corruption, there were these other conceptions of corruption, and the closest and most prominent was dependence, uh, in a, in a, I'm sorry, was um, improper dependence, and dependence corruption is an instance of improper dependence. Just to end here, famous quote I'm sure many are familiar with. When Ben Franklin was asked at the end, uh, after the convention, what have you wrought? He responded to the woman in the street of Philadelphia, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. So a republic, by which he meant a representative democracy, by which they meant a government dependent upon the people alone. I don't think there should be any doubt that that conception of the republic has been lost. And if we're to get it back, we need to find a way to restore this essential dependence by removing the conflicting, competing dependence, which makes it impossible for us, I think, to govern and certainly to claim ourselves as the inheritors of that republic. Thanks very much. Also, be wrong when he says that he can at this 
within the natural faction, the cause of this faction can't be eradicated. Maybe one cause needs to be looked at more intensely. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and, and here, let me just give you a, a map of how I'm going to respond to every question like that. Every single problem you identify, I'm going to show you how, in fact, the root is the corruption I've described. So you want to talk about the inequality problem. Uh, I'm sure many people are familiar with um, a Hacker and Pearson book, um, Winner Take All Politics, which has this wonderful synthesis of research demonstrating the way in which the United States has you know, hit a kind of inflection point in producing radical increase in inequality. Um, so this nice framing. Um, so imagine the difference between a place called um, uh, is it Broad um, Richistan and Broadland. So Broadland is a country where everybody's getting rich, not uh, uh, better off, not necessarily at the same rate, but everybody's kind of getting better off. Um, and Richistan is a country where only the very rich are getting better off. Everybody else is staying at the same place. And, he's, and their frame is that the United States was Broadland until about the middle of the 1970s, and then became Richistan. And since the beginning, since the middle of the 1970s, we've had this radical increase in inequality. But the most important part of their book, from my perspective, is their account of why this inequality was produced. And their account was it was a series of changes in governmental policy that bring about the influences that produce this radical increase in inequality. And if it's a series of changes in governmental policy, then it opens up for me to say, well, what's influencing the series of changes in governmental policy? It's the way in which we're funding these campaigns. Now, it's a little bit more, there's more to the politics of this. Um, no, I think there's uh, two changes you could think of as exogenous to this. One is the cost of campaigns are going up dramatically as technology makes it so every congressperson thinks he has to have an you know, evening tracking poll to figure out what people are thinking about that Congress. So the cost of campaigns is going up dramatically. And in the, middle, in the 1990s, the political parties become uh, super competitive. So when Gingrich takes over the House, in 1995, it's the first time the Republicans, the Republicans have controlled the House in 40 years. And every single election from 1995 on is an election for the control of Congress. Um, and so as corporate scholars would say, there's a kind of a control premium every single election. And the control premium in a world where rent seeking is common is very valuable. So every single election, you have both parties furiously trying to regain control of Congress. And in doing that, they have to raise tons and tons of money to be able to win the elections. And in raising the money, they spend their time talking to people who want to fund them. They spend their time talking to the Lesters. Now, that life, raising money, filters out certain kind of people from being Congress, Congress, members of Congress. So when my, I started doing this work in, in 2007, my congressman, who was, at the time was Tom Lantos, died and people tried to recruit me to run for Congress. And said, you know, you want to reform the system, go to the system and reform. So Joe Trippi, who ran Dean's campaign, appeared on my doorstep. He said, I'll run your campaign. So I, Joe stayed with me for the weekend and you know, tried to talk me through what this would be. And Saturday morning, he sat down and he said, here's the thing, though. You need to promise me that every single day between now and the day that you announce your retirement from government, you will get on the phone for two to four hours a day calling people to raise money. Uh, and I said, no, no, Joe, I can just send emails. He said, no, you have to call them. It's the only way it works. And I said, well, this makes it a very easy decision for me, because there is just literally no way I could do that. And then you begin to think, well, who are the people who can do that? What are they like? Now, you don't need to do that if you're a millionaire, which explains why you know, the average wealth in the Senate is something like dollars right now, and the house is increasing, and half of them are millionaires, and it's not just their house value, but their real value is millionaires, so, you know, because then you don't have to worry about raising money. Um, but it really excludes uh, people who are not crazy and who are not millionaires from being considered as candidates here. Um, I, we met, uh, I met with a bunch of freshmen beginning of this last uh, Congress who came to Cambridge to, to be taught at the Kennedy School about how to be congress, congressman. And one of these guys was a freshman from California, and he said, you know, I, I ran for Congress in my pajamas. You know, that's in California, they're kind of weird out there. But what he meant was, he literally never left his house. He didn't give speeches, he didn't shake hands, he just sat in his house 
calling people to this change. And he was lamenting the fact that his job didn't change after getting to Washington. He was still spending all his time raising money. The only difference was he had to wear a suit. He couldn't do it in his pajamas anymore because he had to show up to, to work. Um, so, so I think that uh, you know, if we could change the way you fund elections, you widen the range of people who could be plausible can, you know, competitors. Um, you know, middle class working people in theory could be candidates um, the way public funding systems in Maine and Connecticut and Arizona have produced a different mix of people with candidates. Uh, and that may make it easier for Congress to recognize the income inequality issue as a salient issue because more of the people in Congress might be closer to having to worry about that problem than, than have to worry about that problem. Uh, so I think it's late. Um, but I agree with you, this is a very significant problem to get fiscal reforms. Uh, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, I believe, bought uh, the Washington Post. Uh, he was criticized because that was a money losing enterprise, but does it fit in with what you're saying in terms of influence and uh, uh, ways it's making it difficult for the Supreme Court to do anything about it? Yeah, so you could, you could worry that, um, you know, as the press has been used historically, um, uh, Bezos would use the Washington Post for his own personal gain. You could worry about that. I'm not worried about that because I don't think you know any media outlet today has the power that newspapers at one time had in the country. And um, and again, from my perspective, newspapers have their you know, primary effect by affecting the people, um, and that's not a that's off the table for worrying about from the perspective of corruption. Um, you might worry about the way newspapers you know, become a tool that uh, is used to leverage power inside Congress like super PACs do, a, a similar kind of protection racket running around different places. But I just don't think there is a media outlet you know, at the newspaper level that has that kind of history. I've not yet been good about the Supreme Court to worry about. But, I'm not somebody who believes that you know we could solve the problem of corruption for all time with one particular structural reform. Indeed, you know, I think that um, if you look at democracies around the world, you know, it's kind of striking to recognize that 70 years ago, conventional wisdom was if we just got democracies everywhere, everything would be great. And we pretty much did get democracies everywhere in the last 70 years. But what's striking is everywhere in the world where there's democracy, trust and faith in government's collapse. Failing everywhere. There are a couple countries, like New Zealand, and the state of Maine, but basically everywhere else, there is rising skepticism about, um, about uh, the way democracy functions. And I would attribute a big chunk of that to a corruption problem throughout these different countries. But the form of the corruption is different. And the corruption that we face is nothing like the corruption the Italians face, or the Germans, or the British. But there's a, you know, tr you can translate the concept of corruption in each of these countries and see the way in which it is achieving the same consequence of rent seeking um, gone crazy. Um, uh, and so that's to suggest that if we solve the rent seeking problem, you know, this round, it, you know, metastasizes and it forms itself in another way the next round. Um, so there's a constant need to worry about how it will manifest its influence. Uh, and so it may be someday that we have to worry about that. To use mining companies, right? Whereas in this case, this is something that the person being, under your term, restored wants. So it's more like I'm soliciting a bribe. I'm effectively saying, give me a bribe, I'm going to give you something you want. Yeah, I only mean, I don't mean that I could win a prosecution under an extortion statute. So I don't mean technically the legal concept, of, but, I'm, but I mean the dynamic is similar. You're using your power to force somebody to behave in a way that's benefiting you. 
Um, so it's because the government has enormous power, not only in its regulatory, but also in its benefit side. Um, uh, and that dynamic creates uh, the incentive, creates an incentive for them to fund their campaigns. And it manifests itself in lots of contexts. There's a, there's a great piece, um, study of um, where Congress spent its time, what, what projects Congress was working on. And if you, so if I said to you in the first quarter of 2011, what was the number one issue Congress spent its time dealing with? You know, if you added up the time on the floor and time in committees, what's the number one issue? You know, we're in the middle of two wars. There's a huge unemployment problem. There's a um, debt ceiling issue coming up just on the horizon. There's still a bunch of issues in health care to deal with. So what's the number one issue? And the answer is the bank swipe fee controversy. <laughs> so what's the bank swipe fee controversy? Well, when you use a debit card, the banks have to uh, get to collect a certain amount of money. The retailers have to pay a certain amount of money, and that's regulated. Um, and so uh, there's a fight between two very large interests to affect this in one way or the other. And what Congress finds is when they go, you know, talk about it, they lean a little bit this way, money rains down from that side, they lean a little bit this way, money rains down on this side. It's just a device to flush money into the system. And so it's used in this way. So every single, you know, there's at the end of the article, it says, you know, there's, there's never any resolution of any issue in Congress. One year's resolution is just the opening bid for next year's fight. But the point is, Congress is self consciously structuring itself in this context um, to facilitate this, uh, what I feel like is a distortion like game, because what it's doing is making it easy for them to, to live, you know, to, I don't want to, you know, it's really important to me not to turn them into the, to evil people in this way, right? I, I don't think this is an interest, I don't think this is a story of criminals or a story of, which is to suggest extortion is a bad word here, so maybe we should push back on it. But I don't think these are criminals, these are bad people in a corrupt, in, you know, self-consciously corrupting system. It would be miserable to be a congressman spending this amount of time raising money. Anything you can do to, to reduce that would be something you likely want to do. So I can understand why this you know, appeals to people. You know, let's, let's not talk about unemployment too much. It doesn't really return us a lot. Um, let's spend the time talking about bank swipe fee controversy, because I find it easier um, in that context to satisfy the needs, uh, the tax that I have to raise money. So uh, a couple of things. Uh, I have a question about the I'm having trouble getting my mind around the core analytic concept of uh, corruption here. It seems to be a state of affairs in which the office holders are not dependent upon the people alone. And it seems to me that the terms there are so contestable in their application. It's very hard to tell what uh, work that idea is doing. Now, the substantive account of what's going on is conspicuous to the state. Huge range of possible descriptions of corruption. So I'm having trouble building a bridge between this original assumption of corruption and uh, the phenomenon that uh, you described. And the second question has to do with uh, revenue. It seems to me that it's an about that agency proposal where lots of individuals got vouchers that they could uh, allocate to members of Congress. And the super PACs would buy advertisements to try to persuade people to allocate their money here or there. Still be vulnerable to super PAC spending in the last month of the election. I'm not sure how this would help. Okay. So, first, with respect to what work the concept does, um, first remember, you know, if there's a target for this argument, it's the five justices who call themselves originalists, who are marching down a path to a position where they say the only conception of corruption that is constitutionally permissible is quid pro quo. So my response to them is, you can't as an original say that. You have to be open to other conceptions of corruption. Here's another, dependence corruption, but the point is you can't say quid pro quo is the only one. Now, now you know, what that does by just doing that is to say, well, if your regulation is plausibly an instance of, of attacking dependence corruption, then you've got to be able to hold it to be the kind of corruption that is permissible under this scheme. And there's going to be a hard problem in lots of cases to, ask, to answer the question whether this is really dependence corruption. 
I'm not going to go into the analytics of it, but I think it actually is a is a more is a clearer concept than um, than you know, this sketch of it suggests. So, for example, your first instinct might be, well, you know, isn't the primary an example of dependence corruption because you've got you know a small number, you know, 11 percent of the public picking the candidate, and then that's going to the general election. And I would say that's not dependence corruption because, in fact, anybody can participate in the primary in a way that not anybody can be elected to the primary. Uh, and this then suggests the work that could be done by thinking about the you know, white primary races, right? Um, a bunch of those, are, you know, the, most of the interesting um, jurisprudence in that context is on, on the race line. But there's some interesting analysis which is just focusing on the democracy line. There's something wrong with the system which is making it so certain citizens cannot participate by a characteristic they cannot control. So, so I do think there's a lot of work here, but one interesting, um, it might seem counterintuitive, but I, I think I'm committed to this position, is imagine you had a political system, you know, Canada has something close to this, but a political system that selected a random selection of citizens, let's say 300 citizens, Deliberate poll like structure and ask them to select the candidates who get to run in the general election. Would that be discriminatory? So now it's only 300, it's not 149. <coughs> and I guess my, I think I'm committed to the view that that's not dependence corruption because it's plausible that the 300 are representative. Right? They are, not everybody is a member of that, but they are, everybody is represented in that 300 if it's done in the right way. So the mere fact that the small number doesn't constitute and all the small number of cases are not dependent corruption, unless you are formally excluding relevant citizens, and unless there is formally excluding someone else. Uh, that's, so I think there is work to be done, but the point is, I don't need to bear the burden of convincing you of the precise contours of dependence corruption for the purposes of saying, you, the Supreme Court, originalists on the Supreme Court, cannot say quid pro quo is the only corruption that's allowed. Um, so the second part of your question I really want to get um, Big super PACs. Oh, super PACs. Okay, okay. Um, so. Um, or it's still in the last month of the election, and I'm not the big voucher to protect yeah. myself against that. Yeah. So I'm committed to the view that you can't worry about the consequence of speech as directed to the people. So you can't regulate super PACs spending for people. That's why Citizens United has rightly decided that they're allowed to do what they want to public resources. But remember, I said that I think speech now is wrong with so speech now raised the question whether you can limit contributions to super PACs. It was, the question wasn't whether you could limit super PAC spending, but could you limit contributions to super PACs the way you limit contributions to individual consumers? <coughs> and my view is a dependence corruption account says, yes, you can limit contributions to super PACs. Um, and if you limited contributions to super PACs, um, then super PACs just wouldn't be as significant Handily, I've got these numbers here. Um, uh, if you look at outside spending after Citizens United, the most dramatic thing Citizens United does is radically increase outside spending. Now, why was that? Because rich people before Citizens United had the capacity under Buckley to spend their money independently. Right? So there, Buckley is the one that gave independent expenditures constitutional protection. Citizens United didn't extend to you know, significant class this um, additional protection. But what speech now did is give constitutional sanction to this entity that facilitated an efficient, or what was thought to be an efficient, or call it do $100 million with no apparent effect, but seemed to be an efficient mechanism for channeling this rich person's money. Because the rich person you know, doesn't want to go out there and figure out how to spend $50 million on the way much of their own. Um, but if somebody comes and is highly qualified and says, well, give me your $50 million, then, um, then there's a much higher uh, likelihood that we see it. In fact, that's what happened. People are willing to devote their money in a different way. So if you can limit contributions to super PACs, then the significance of super PACs in the story, I think, falls dramatically. And yes, they're going to try to persuade people to devote their money in one way or the other. But in my view, that's democracy. You know, if super PACs are out there saying, give your vouchers to John Sarbanes, 
The only way that's effective is to bring together a million people to give their vouchers to stop Sarbanes. Anything that depends upon getting a million people to do the same thing is just a dynamic we want democracy to exploit. That's what democracy is supposed to be doing. And that's fine from my perspective. Um, relative to a world where we're talking about how to get 10,000 people to do something, 10,000 people to do something that they have no say in. Okay. Sorry, making me run all the time. So I should have that. No, I don't think the people are less affected. Um, you know, of course, the framers conceived of citizenship as a public office, and they would have thought it was just as improper for an individual citizen to vote in a way that was thinking about his own self-interest as it would be for a member of Congress to vote in a way that was focused on his own self-interest, as opposed to focusing on the public interest. And from the very beginning of democracy, people have predicted that what democracy would do would collapse, it would collapse because demagogues would be appealing to voters to vote in their private interests, and that would be a dynamic that could be described as a trend direction. And, and you know, I think we can look at very important problems with our current political system and link it to the populism that makes it hard to do the right thing when you want to do the best to get, where it's entitlement programs, where it's the way we we make uh, money in the system to get fed. So I'm not saying that those aren't problems. I am saying I think the Supreme Court has put off the table regulations aimed at policing the way people try to get, the way powerful forces try to influence people. I think the court has basically said, government doesn't have the right to muck about in the name of fear about the distorting effects, the way in which the people are persuaded. Now, you can disagree with that. I'm not saying, I'm not, you know, saying it's necessarily a good thing, but I'm offering as a way of understanding where it's absolutely clear that the First Amendment is going to prohibit regulation. It's prohibiting regulation clearly where the regulation is trying to affect the way that the people are being um, uh, manipulated and suffered, but it's not, um, uh, and that might mean that we're vulnerable to the kind of corruption we're talking about in a very significant way. But I still think it's a distinct and at the present time less significant kind of corruption than the corruption that uh, the Congress and himself himself talk about. Yeah. In your system, how would you guard against a charismatic individual being able to mobilize the use of modern technology to raise a tremendous amount of money for individuals who think the same way he does or she um, and that then gets corruption going in that direction. Yeah I I I agree that's a potential risk. It's a similar Similar concern to the last question. The concern here is you have an incentive now to, in effect, play the opportunity with the people as opposed to play the opportunity with the members of Congress. And so they have the potential to be as destructive to our discussion of what we do with government as members of Congress doing the wrong thing with respect to, with respect to uh, um, state government. I guess I would. I guess I, my, my view is that I'm less concerned about that. Um, it hasn't actually happened much in our history, a couple of times, uh, but it hasn't happened much. Um, and, uh, you know, if we have 
sufficient checks on what that demagogue can do, you know, to not argue too much, um, uh, then, uh, you know, there's just a continuing democratic process to throw them out. And if, you know, if somebody is actually really successful in persuading millions and millions of people to not only give their votes, but also give their democracy vouchers, um, uh, you know, this is the sort of reward that we're supposed to praise within democracy. That's what democracy is about. You know, can I guarantee that democracy is going to produce the right answer? Um, how do you guarantee that? But I think that it's systematically less of a risk and the risk of the system we produce right now. And the system that we produce right now, I think it's, you know, the first point that I make, I think it's the, the most important point, which is just you know, tell me the context where our government is capable of making sensible decisions. Here. And you could be of the view that our government doesn't need to make sensible decisions. The status quo is perfectly fine. But I think it's hard to actually sustain that. For people on the left and people on the right. People on the left and the right think that the government's got to do certain things. And it's incapable of doing those things because of a systematic distortion that's produced by the way in which we fund these campaigns. There might be an analogous distortion that impacts you know, the people that are deciding it, um, but I'm less convinced that, that of that. I'm more concerned with the less urgent distortion on the campaign side that I think is most. The best question. Yeah, the best question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll try. Um, um, I really was fascinated by your um, your analysis, and I'm sorry it took me a little bit away because I don't think my questions have been as impactful. So I have two questions, and I'll ask ask them in one. Um, I live in Virginia, and uh, I've been here for a few months, and one of the reasons why I haven't gotten a new SIM card for my phone, I haven't lost it, um, is the robocalls. Um, I am getting slayed by robocalls. And a lot of them are um, clearly fraudulent. But the robocallers are politically protected because all this campaign money that you're talking about, where it's coming, where a lot of it is being spent is on misleading robocalls. But what happens is that um, the whole system grinds to a halt, or people become really frustrated with democracy. And frankly, in Virginia, we have two or possibly three candidates that are emblematic of Gresham's Law at the worst. Okay? Virginia used to have a tradition of valuing integrity in politics. I don't think people in Virginia um, can say that now. And I've been a voter in Virginia for several months, and not hearing all the complete garbage on the radio and, and as I said, horrible world calls. So I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah, so uh, you know, if I if I follow up on what I promised in response to the first question, we need to find a way to tie the problems I identified back to the election of the election. And I'll confess up front that I don't think I'm going to explain a huge percentage of this problem with the corruption issue, but I think it um, you know, if you if you accept the framing that we have two elections, um, it turns out that it doesn't make sense to try to engage a large number of people in the second election. In fact, the system works better for people on his side if we can have relatively stable subsets of the voting population participate in a huge part of democracy. If we had the Australian rule where everybody had to show up to the polls, that would have a pretty significant effect on what you said. Because you would need to, if that ties to gerrymandering, um, you can use that to play a very different kind of campaign. There's a whole bunch of people that are going to be out there who are going to be upset with the way you've spoken and the way you've been questioning the mainstream right wing speech and what they want to punish. Um, and so people don't engage. And I think that's not a criticism of. I think in our system, it doesn't make sense for many people to engage. Like, why would you wait for in a world where the Lester's have the power the Lester's have, um, and you've got a job or two jobs or kids or a hobby or a life? Why would you 
And what we know from social science is, in fact, going down the economic um, scales, um, there's less and less engagement at not just the contribution level, but also at the voting level and the volunteering level and every other level. Rationally disengaging seems to me to be perfectly uh, sensible. Um, the same thing with the, so just to have to try to build the policy consensus. You know, politics, the political machines are pretty smart. They, they know who they're trying to help. And if you're upset, they're not trying to help. If you're being bothered by it, you're not the target. And so um, they're happy to see that you're upset. I mean, they're not happy you're upset, but they don't care that you're upset because their objective is to reach a certain community or a certain population. And presumably, if they're sensible, they're reaching the population. And we just live in a world where it's hard to segment, or it's increasingly easy to segment relative to what it was before, but it's still hard to segment. Um, and you can see some of this. There's a, I did a, just a little piece about um, this report at the beginning of October 2012 on NPR, which was a, um, uh, an account of Romney and Obama's um, economic. And uh, they had their Trump speech, they had their Obama speech. And each of them had five themes. And they were practically identical. Like they each began with, this is the most important election that you're going to face, fundamentally affect the economy. But you went through each of these five points of, on four of the five, they were literally identical. On the fifth, they were slightly different themes. And you know, you think, what's this about? And what it's about is that they're both looking at the same data, they're both identifying exactly the same class they have to have an effect on swinging. And so the campaign shifts to focus on exactly how they persuade that person. And for you know, all of us, we don't care. We don't care. We're, not, we're, not, we're not talking about that. Um, so I think that if we found a different way to structure incentives, um, we change the behavior. And what I'm trying to do is increase the number of people who you need to persuade as a candidate in the funding election. And I think a unintended but nice byproduct of that is that you also increase the number of people in the economy to persuade in the voting election. Because in a $50 voucher, you need to persuade a lot of people to give you money. You don't need to persuade 1,000 people, you need to persuade 10,000 people, whatever the number is that you're going to be persuading. So you are going to be working as hard as you can to, to, to speak to a wide range of people to be funding you. Um, and that, I think, has the effect of including more people, bringing more people into the political process um, uh, than are involved right now. So one thing that Obama campaign taught us is small contributions, even a token, bring people into the political process in a more committed way um, than if they're not committed. Um, so that would be my answer. Well, I want to make, I just want to make sure that I keep my minutes ending on time. Oh, but you started on time. Sell something. Uh, 
So if you're appealing to 100,000 customers, I guess my only problem, my thought is perhaps that, you know, corruption in the electoral system is definitely different. In fact, in fact, in fact, it allows the other sort of people to sustain itself by decreasing the students, by using the alternatives, and by not showing this to be a problem. Are you breathing? 
Okay, good. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to argue that all of these questions would be more fun with a snack and a drink, yeah, okay. which is right there, like right on the other side of those doors. But you have a little cue there. I don't want to ruin the cue, but 